I had some people come up and say, they use prayer list. Is that wrong? You know, I was just, it's not wrong for you to use a prayer list. But I'm saying that if you have your prayer time so structured that you already know what you're going to say for the whole time and there's no interaction with God, then that's not true prayer. I believe that it'd be much better for you to just let the Holy Spirit lead you. Matter of fact, I was talking to Oral Roberts not long before he died, and Oral Roberts says he never prays in English until after he's already prayed in tongues. He says he doesn't know how to pray. And so he prays and gets the Holy Spirit to give him wisdom. But most people don't even need the Holy Spirit to pray the way they pray. They already got their old prayer time all lined out. They already know what they're going to say, and they say the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And you know what? That's not true prayer. As I went through my uh, outline, I didn't get very far in this, so <laughs> let me mention a couple of things real quickly. In, Psalm, in Acts chapter 19, verse 10, this verse really, really impacted my life. This is 40 years ago. And Ananias was praying, and the Lord spoke unto him and said, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. That verse changed my life. And some of you think, what is special about that verse? The Lord spoke to me, and he said, Andrew, how many times have I wanted to say something to you, and you weren't there? Ananias was there. Ananias was just listening, and from Scripture, we don't know that God ever spoke anything profound to him before or after but when the Lord needed somebody to go minister to Saul, Ananias was just there, just hanging with the Lord. This goes along with the point that I was making at the very end of the last class is that we want the spectacular. We want a voice from heaven. We want a goosebump. We want an angel. We want the spectacular. And those things do happen occasionally. But you know what? The vast majority of your relationship with God is just going to be hanging out with them. There's not going to be anything awesome you aren't going to see or hear anything. You're just going to have a peace in your heart knowing that God's with you and you just love the Lord. Adam and Eve, I don't believe that, you know, they had the great spectacular happen. They just met with the Lord in the cool of the day. And what did they do? They didn't have any devils to cast out. They didn't have clothes to believe for. They didn't have to pray about a new house. They didn't have to come up with tuition. They didn't have to rebuke this. They didn't have to pray over the politics. They didn't have to rebuke the weather. If you took all of the stuff that people spend time praying over today in a fallen world away, did you know many of us wouldn't have had anything to talk to the Lord about? Because our prayer time is all doing something just, you know, fantastic. It's got to be spectacular. We're dealing with the problems of the world. We're praying over all this. What did Adam and Eve do when they visited with God every day? I believe that they just said, Father, we saw some of the most awesome animals today. You just did an awesome job. There's one, there's one animal that can eat from the top of a tree. It's got such a long neck. <laughs> then they thought, you know, like the duck bill platypus. It's like you had all of these parts left over and you just put them into this one animal. <laughs> it was awesome. God, we saw a great sunrise today. We ate this fruit today that we've, and this is the best one yet. And you know, I believe that that was fellowship with God. Most of your time with the Lord is just, you know, you ought to start by saying, Father, what a great day. Psalms 92, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to give praises unto thy name, to show forth your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. So in the morning, Father, thank you that you love me. Thank you that this is going to be an awesome day. Just thank you for your blessings. And then every night rehearse. Father, thank you for how faithful you were today. You know what? That's relationship with God. That's what prayer is. And if you would spend more time relating to God and praying with Him like that, then you wouldn't have to spend as much time fasting and praying and tearing down this and binding because you'd just have, you'd have peace in your life. Your immune system would work better. You wouldn't get sick as often. You wouldn't have any of the mental problems. You wouldn't be upset by what people say because God had just shown you that He loves you and He's pleased with you. And so when somebody comes up and spits in your face, no big deal. Man, God Almighty loves me. And, and it just gives you a resilience. It's like all of the problems of this world are like water off a duck's back because you're in relationship with God. You're visiting with God. And so who cares if this person rejects you? Who cares if this problem comes up? Who cares if the doctor says you're going to die? 
I mean, we sing, when we all get to heaven, what a day that'll be. And then the doctor tells you you're going and you start crying. <laughs> Something's wrong with this. If you were really in fellowship with the Lord and if the doctor told you you were going to die, it'd be all you could do to keep from just kissing him. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. Man, I could see Jesus before the day's over. <laughs> if you were in relationship with the Lord, which is what prayer to me is all about and if you were communing with him and letting him speak to you you wouldn't fall apart at all of the stuff that happens man that really changed my life that Ananias was just there there's no indication that anything spectacular had happened for 10 years before he was just there how many other people weren't there they were out doing something they weren't listening and because he was available, God said, go to the street called Straight and inquire for Saul. And he was able to commission, lay hands on, heal. The greatest minister that the world's ever seen came because this guy was just hanging out with the Lord and he was there. He was available. Man, that's awesome. You need to get to where you just cultivate living in the presence of the Lord. You know, there's a book by a... a a priest, a medieval priest, I think his name was Brother Lawrence. And he's got a book entitled Pre Practicing the Presence of the Lord. And uh, anyway, I read that, and it's just amazing. People would come from all over to find out the secrets. And his secret was that he just fellowshiped with the Lord. He practiced the presence of the Lord. He didn't have a devotional time. His whole life was devoted to God. And that was the whole thrust of this book, was just to try and learn that God is always with you and to renew your mind and to receive from God. And so very few people live in the presence of God. They just visit there every once in a while, and they call that prayer. You need to get to where you're just in the presence of the Lord, and you're thanking Him for the sunrise, thanking Him for the birds. Man, I was out last night and hearing the birds... And I thought, man, that's awesome because, you know, it's been cold and there hadn't been as many birds and there's a lot of birds coming back. And I was just praising God. That's awesome. Some of you think, man, that's really trivial. You know what? If you have a relationship with God and just thank Him for the million things, thank Him that you're able to breathe today, that you aren't even thinking about it. You're just breathing and, and it's just an automatic thing. Thank you, Father. Thank you for my health. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this Bible college. Thank you, Father, for the things. The, you don't know all of the miracles that have happened to make this. Thank you, Father, for everything you're doing. you got so much to be thankful for. You can get to where when you're in fellowship with the Lord that really it's hard to squeeze in a request because you're just so thankful for what you've got. Thank God that things are as good as they are. They could be a lot worse. Thank you, Jesus, that they're as good as they are. And you go to thanking God and thinking like that, and you know what? You'll get to where it just... It's, it's no big deal. You know, it has been decades since I have prayed and asked God to give me money. I just don't pray for money. Because that is so trivial compared to thanking God and using my faith to fellowship with Him and to see God in these other things. And because of it, all of this money is just coming upon me and overtaking me. I'm telling you, God gave you bigger things to do than to ask for healing and prosperity and all of these things that so many people are occupied with. If you would just get into worshiping Him and loving Him and fellowshipping with Him and thanking Him for all of His goodness, you'd find out you wouldn't have as many problems. And then when you do have a problem, I'm not saying that you aren't supposed to ask, but you just speak and it's, it's gone. It's done. It's taken care of because your faith has been built up. Also, I need to mention real quickly, Luke chapter 11, I need to share this. I don't know what this is doing to my schedule, but who cares? I'm the president of this school. If I can't do what I want to, who can? Amen. So here in Luke chapter 11, the disciples came and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples, and he gave them the Lord's prayer, or this model prayer that we were talking about from Matthew chapter 6. And then after he got through with that, he says in verse 5, And which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, uh, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, 
and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And so this passage of scripture is often used to say that this is how we're supposed to approach God. There's times that God just doesn't want to answer your prayers. And you've got to just not let him go. You've got to stay after him. You've got to badger him. You've got to just put pressure on him, grab his arm, and twist it until you make him do what you want him to do. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You may not have heard somebody say it exactly that way, but that is exactly the way that this passage of Scripture is taught, that we have to force God. You have to lay hold of the horns of the altar, not let go until God comes out. This is what all prayer for revival is all about. We are going to put pressure on God. We're going to get 100,000 people to pray and put pressure on God, and we aren't going to let go until God sends revival. We're going to make this happen. And this is the way that this is taught. This is not why, Jesus is teaching the exact opposite of this. Let me put it into modern terms. Let me, if I was to walk up to you and say, how many of you have a friend that if you were in trouble and somebody came to you, the stores are closed, you don't have 24-hour stores, and you couldn't go get any food, and you needed to feed this person, and if you went to a person and woke them up at midnight, how many of you have a friend that would tell, y'all leave me alone, I'm in bed, my wife's in bed, my kids are in bed, leave me alone, get out of here, and they would refuse to help you. How many of you have friends like that? Anybody? <laughs> Let me just suggest to you that they aren't friends. The point that he's making is, how many of you have friends, I'm not talking about just an acquaintance, but friends, people that you consider friends who would treat you that rudely. Even if you ask them something at an inconvenient time, they would rise up and give to you because they're a friend. How many people can relate to see what we're talking about? And this is the context because right after it, look at the next verse. He says in verse 9, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And then he says, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? See, this is the exact same logic. He's not using this situation to say this is how God is. He's showing you the absurdity of this. You think people treat you better than this. Friends treat you better than this. Why would you think you have to plead with God and beg God over and over and over and over to do something? Friends treat you better than that. Isn't God the best friend that you've ever had? Isn't God better to you than any person could ever be? If you expect better treatment than this from people, why would you think God would do this to you? If you go to a father and ask him for a piece of bread, how many of you have a father that would give you a stone to bite into so that you could break your teeth? Hopefully none of you have a father like that. And then he says in the next comparison, it says, um, or if he asks a fish, will he give him a, a serpent? And can you imagine a child going to their father and saying, could I have a piece of fish? And he gives you a serpent. It's going to bite you. Or if he asks an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? The human relationships, is this how it works? There may be some exceptions, but I'm saying normally, no. People treat you better than this. Your parents treat you better than this. Why do we think that God has to be begged and pleaded with, and we have to just grab hold and not let go until we make God do something? You know why we think that? Because it's not a true relationship. It's just a religious formula. You go through your things, and you just keep pushing the buttons until you make God come out. If you would change it so that prayer is a relationship and you talk to him and you just ask him and you know that, Father, I know that you love me more than my earthly father ever did, more than any friend. A friend, if, you know, right now, if I was in trouble, I could go to probably any person in here. And even though I don't know many of you very well, I could ask you to help me and, and any one of you would help me, even if it was inconvenient. If I can expect that kind of treatment from you, why would I think that God would be less inclined to help me than you? That is wrong, wrong, wrong. 
And it's because people see aren't in prayer. We aren't really connecting with God. It's just a religious formula. And you go through and you, you do your thing and then you, got, you don't see the manifestation and you get disappointed. Like, God, what's wrong with you? It's because you never connected with him in the first place. There is no real connection. There's no real interaction. You're just going through your formulas. Man, that's not what prayer is. This is not preaching that you just beg and plead with God. It's preaching the exact opposite. It's trying to get across the point that you don't have to badger God. God will answer you speedily. If you ask, you will receive. You seek, you will find. If you knock, it will be given unto you. And see, if we had more of a relationship with God to where you were experiencing His love, you'd know that. And then when you ask, you would expect, you would know for certain that God is going to come through because you know Him. He's spoken so many things to you. He's always good. But you don't always get that if all you're doing is just religious stuff. Look in the 18th chapter. I'm going through these real quickly because I need to get on. But in the 18th chapter is another example that people use about prayer to teach how prayer should be. Chapter 18, verse 1, And he spake a, a parable unto them, to this end, that man ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary, and he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And people use this to say that this is the way God is. This, is. this is to make the opposite point that religion has taught. This is not a comparison, it's a contrast. God is not like an unjust judge that doesn't fear God or fear man. That's not a good representation. It's just showing you that even in the natural realm, you expect to get better treatment than this from people. If you think that people, an unjust judge, would eventually give in to you, then how much more should you expect good treatment from God? This is not a comparison. It's a contrast. And look what he says in verse 6. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he... Not he, God, but he, the unjust judge, bear along with them. People will always say, see, sometimes God just bears along with you and you have to stick with it and God is going to test you and all of these things. This isn't saying this. It's saying exactly the opposite. God will answer you speedily, though he, the unjust judge, bear along with them. This is, again, not a comparison, it's a contrast, and it's showing you that, man, you ought to have such a relationship with God that He's your best friend, you fellowship with Him, He talks to you, He just speaks things to you, and when you have a need, you go and you just know that it doesn't matter if it's at midnight, doesn't matter if it's convenient or not, God is going to take care of you. God loves you more than you love yourself. And isn't that awesome? If we were to stop right here, you know what? This could revolutionize your prayer life. If you just quit having formulas. If you quit looking at the clock and I've got to pray an hour, bless God. You know, when I first started, I forced myself to pray. I remember in Vietnam, this is back before I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I would spend four hours on bunker guard and I would pray for four hours. And I tell you what, that was hard. And I did that every day for 13 months. And there was some benefit to it because it forced me to be stayed upon God. Prior to that time, I had, my life hadn't been where I stayed on God. And so there was some benefit to it. I'm not saying that you can't have a certain time just for discipline. But here's the way I look at it. If you do it to discipline yourself, and say, if I let myself go, I'm not going to keep my mind stayed on you. And so I'm just going to dedicate. Instead of going home and watching TV from 7 o'clock until 10 o'clock, I'm just going to take that time and I'm going to dedicate it unto the Lord. And if you do that as a discipline upon yourself, that's fine. But if you do it thinking that's what God demands and that you have to have this time set aside and that God's displeased with you or whatever, and if that's your motivation, then it's a work of the flesh and it's not... It's not producing. 
So it really depends on your attitude. There's nothing wrong with you having a prayer list. There's nothing wrong with you setting aside a certain time and praying as long as you just say, Father, I know that you're with me all of the time and that I can pray with you, but I want to spend, I want to discipline myself and get to where I'm focused on you without any distractions. And so I'm going to do this for me to help me. If, you know, you can do these things with the right attitude. And I'm saying the way that most of us have been taught that you just have to do this and that God demands all of these things of you, it's, it's wrong. You know, Jamie, when, when I proposed to Jamie, I remember exactly what I said. I said, Jamie, I want you to spend the rest of, of your life with sharing my life. I forgot exactly how I said it now. <laughs> I want you to share the rest of my life with me. And I wanted Jamie to be my wife and my companion. Did you know, I didn't even know if Jamie could cook when we got married. I didn't know if she could wash clothes, clean the house. I didn't know any of those things. I didn't care about that. I wanted Jamie for a companion. And it turns out Jamie does all of those things. And Jamie keeps a really good house. I've told, I think I've mentioned this, that our spices are alphabetized. <laughs> Everything in our house is just absolutely perfect. If I want to sit there and think, now where is something? All I got to do is think, what would Jamie do? And I can guarantee you it's exactly where it's supposed to be. Jamie keeps a tight ship. We got a sign there, wipe your paws. You got to take your shoes off. Now she lets me walk in with my boots, but if I have shoes on, I always got to take them off. I mean, she runs a tight house and you know what? It's nice and I enjoy it. But if Jamie got to where she was more concerned about that house than she was about me, the thing that, would, it, that is now a blessing to me would cease to be a blessing. I'd actually become envious of it. If she got to where she loved her carpet more than she loved me, it would cease to be a blessing. So Jamie does all of these things that in their place, it adds to it. But you know what? I didn't marry Jamie to get a housekeeper to get a cook, I could hire somebody to do that. I wanted to love Jamie and have her love me. And that's the reason that I married her. And likewise, the Lord just wants you. And it's nice that, yes, you pray and intercede for other people, but if you start interceding and substituting that for your personal relationship with God, and if you start praying over every person and you're going to stand there and you're going to make sure that they get into relationship with God and you start doing all of these things, if you get to where you're more focused on doing than you are just being in relationship with God, did you know God will, will get to where he hates all of those things? There's scriptural precedent for this. In the Old Testament, he commanded the sacrifices. He commanded them to be offered. But later, when people were going through the motions and doing all of the religious things, but their heart wasn't right, he said, I hate your sacrifices. They are a stink in my nostrils. Away with them. Those are things he commanded them to do. But the problem was they had substituted doing for being. You're a human being, not a human doing. You need to have a relationship with God. You are the object of God's love. And if you are using prayer to get things done and to ask for this and to do this and to bind that and to lose this and you're doing all of these things and if you aren't in relationship with the Lord, you're missing the whole purpose of prayer. If you aren't enjoying the Lord, if he's not enjoying you, you're missing the purpose of prayer. Now, prayer also is an opportunity for you to ask and receive and to intercede for other people. There's a place for that, but it's not the place that it occupies. People have just made prayer into, you know, it's like going into a grocery store and you got a cart and it's just gimme, gimme, gimme. And you get and you get and you use God. You know, if, if the only time you came to me was you needed something, and you just, could I have this? Could I have this? And you're always getting something. Or if you're really spiritual, this person needs this. Give this to me so I can give it to them. And if that's all our relationship consisted of and there was never any time that you just had relationship with me, did you know it would not be a blessing to me? I'd think all they're doing is using me. I've got some people like that in my life. That when they need something... I'm, uh, they're always coming to me. But if they don't need anything, there's no relationship. They never, just, they never enjoy being with me. They just use me. 
They know that I got deep pockets, and if they need something, they come ask me. And so there's people like that. There's people in the ministry like that. And you know what? I still treat them nice, and I still do the right thing. But you know what? I, I don't enjoy that. There's other people that I give to and do things. But you know what? They just they enjoy me. We're friends. And it wouldn't matter if I ever gave them anything. Those are the people that I really enjoy, enjoy being with. God is a person. He's a real person. He's got feelings. And if you could see him as a real person, and if you could make prayer a personal relationship with God, you'd quit some of the stupid things that we do. You'd quit coming to him only when you're in trouble. And when things are going good, you'd enjoy it. You know, I was just in Cancun, and I was just praising God, looking out there at the water and just praising God. And I was thinking, it's terrible people that don't know God. They don't know who to thank for a beautiful day and for all of this stuff. But man, it is awesome to have a person that you know that created everything and to thank them and have somebody that you can talk to and say, man, this is awesome. You did a great job. That's, a, that's really the majority of my relationship with the Lord. I spend very little time asking for anything. Man, it's just praising God for who he is, how good he's been. God has been good to this boy. God has treated me well, and I just am constantly thanking him. I don't do it as well as I should, but I'm saying I, that's what my whole prayer life is about. Ninety-something percent of my prayer is just, Father, you're awesome. Thank you for your goodness. I spend very, very little time asking God for anything. You don't have to. God's anticipated every need that you'll ever have, and he's already supplied it. And if you'd get into relationship with him and just start loving him like that, you, you find out that, man, before you even got the need, God's already supplied your, has already given you the supply. It's already done. Amen or oh me. It would change things. Can somebody hear that? <laughs> we need to pray for your hearing if you don't hear that. So anyway... Hopefully, I'm over here in the next lesson. And this brings me to Acts chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. In Acts chapter 13, Paul and Silas and a number of other people were, were praying and ministering unto the Lord. What does that mean, they were ministering unto the Lord? See, most people think when you're ministering, right now I'm ministering, I'm telling you what you need to do. You need to do this. You need to make prayer more about... And most people think that that's ministry. And it, that is a part of ministry. But I mean, what did they do? Were they telling the Lord, you need to do this. You need to straighten up. You need to repent. You need to... That's not what they were doing. You know what they were doing? When it says that they were ministering unto the Lord, they were just praising God and giving him thanks. They were worshiping the Lord. And you know what that does? It ministers unto the Lord. Again, God is a person. He's not a fallen human being. He's not exactly like us, but we were created in his image. God has feelings. God is love. And the Lord wants to be loved by us. He created us for his pleasure. Re Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 in heaven, they're saying right now, they're saying, uh, how's that go? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, for thou hast for, and for thy pleasure, well, I better read it. I just messed it up. <laughs> Here it is. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That's significant because the original purpose and still the purpose, even though sin is now entered in and everything changed, the original purpose and still God's purpose is for his pleasure. God created you for his pleasure, not just to be his servant, his slave. He could have created more angels. But we are in a different category. We had a free will. God created us for fellowship, for his pleasure. It says in Psalms 35, 27, let all who favor my righteous cause say continually, let God be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. God is pleased when you prosper. 
In the same way that you are pleased when you see your children do good and prosper, God is pleased when you prosper, and he is not pleased when you struggle, when you aren't well, when you are poor, when you're depressed, discouraged. That doesn't please God. It's not that he's mad at you, but he wants to see you prosper. God loves you, and when you just say, Father, I love you, that ministers to the Lord. It blesses the Lord. You know, there's hundreds of scriptures that says, bless the Lord. Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul. It just says it over and over. And yet today we have people that say, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. And they think that that's blessing the Lord. That may or may not bless the Lord. Blessing the Lord is more than just saying those words. There's a woman named uh, Sandy... Um, Sandy Brown, and she was an evangelist, and I mean, just a really powerful lady, but, but Sandy was a cocktail waitress, and waitress in Las Vegas when she got born again, and she was just a rank pagan. And when she got born again, it was radical. She started going to church, and they told her about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, so she wanted that. And she says, how do you get it? And they said, well, you just start blessing the Lord, and then it comes out, and you start speaking in another tongue. So she didn't know very much. She went home, and she figured since it was the word baptism of the Holy Spirit, it had to do with water. So she filled up her bathtub and sat in the bathtub and put candles all around the bathtub. And then she started sitting in the water going, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. And praise God for his mercy, she did receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. But you know what? That is not blessing the Lord by just saying, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. When it says bless the Lord, that means that you tell him how much you love him, you praise him, and if you do it with a pure heart, that actually blesses God. God gets blessed when you just love him. This is a concept most people don't have. Most people think, I have nothing to give God. I'm the one that's in need. And the only way I can do anything for God is to serve Him, do something. i got to do something for God. But you know what? God wants you and your fellowship and your thanksgiving and praise more than He wants what you could do for Him. He wants you. And when He gets you and you just start thanking Him and Thank him for a beautiful sunset, sunrise. Thank him for a nice day. Thank him that he's provided so that you could come to Bible college. Thank you for the friends you've got here, people that would help you. Thank you, Father, for supplying my needs. You just start thanking him. You know what that does? That blesses God. That's a concept most people don't have. They don't think that God is blessed by them, but God is blessed. Just like yesterday, I was thanking him for the opportunity of ministering, and he thanked me for ministering for him. Some people think, oh, God would never do that. You don't know God. You don't know the Lord. I guarantee you, God is a good God, and God gets blessed. You know, back when my kids were like four and six, I took them out horseback riding one day, and I let them each invite one of the neighborhood kids. So there was four kids and me, and we went horseback riding all day long. We played in the creek. We made a swing across the creek. We dammed up the creek. We got filthy, dirty. We ate junk food. We did all of these things and just had an awesome time. And anyway, uh, Peter was about four years old at the time, and when we got back home, we cleaned them up, we prayed with them, had devotion, and did all these things. And as we were, as I was leaving his room, I turned the light off, and I was leaving his room, and he said, Dad? I said, Yes, and he says, You're a good dad. And you know what that did? It blessed me. He didn't go, Bless you, Dad. He just said, you're a good dad. And you know what that did? It blessed me. It made me want to get him up out of bed and go do it all again just so I could hear him say, you're a good dad. And you know what? That's the way that God is. God does all of these things for us. And if somebody would just say, Father, thank you for the day. I've got all kinds of problems. I've got all kinds of things coming. But thank you that things are as good as they are. Thank you for the way that you've moved in my life. I just want to say thank you. You know what that does? It blesses God. That's what they were doing. They were ministering unto God. They were saying, Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the thing. And you know what? That was ministering unto God. 
God was ministered unto. Some of you don't understand that God, any person who loves, has a need to be loved back. It's terrible to love a person and never have that person return your love. In the natural, we've all experienced that, that you've loved somebody and they've rejected your love. Man, that's what tragedies are made of. That's, and yet God loved the world. And you know what? He just wants you to love him back. That's what prayer is. It's just communication, thanking him for all of the good things that he's done. And when you do that, it blesses God. It ministers unto the Lord. And that is what you were and are created to do, is to bring pleasure to the Lord. And I can promise you that you find a person who's a giver, God so loved that he gave, God is the ultimate giver. You find a person like that, I can guarantee you, they'll never let you out give them. Never. And if you just start worshiping the Lord and thanking him for how good he is, thank you, Father, for what you've done in my life. And you do that, I guarantee you, God is going to bless you more. He'll want to get you out of bed and make you go do it all over again just so he can hear you say, you're a good dad. You're a good God. I'm telling you, if we would use prayer like this for a relationship with God, to just worship Him and love Him and thank Him and remind yourself of His goodness and do things like that, if you would use prayer for that, you wouldn't have to ask God for very much. It would just open up a floodgate of God's supply. You would start finding supernatural abundance, prosperity, healing, joy, peace. When things do go wrong, it would be insignificant compared to the fact that you've been fellowshipping with God. And God just told you how much he loved you, and so it doesn't matter. You know, I have people criticize me all the time. I've got hundreds of blogs written about how terrible a person I am and stuff like that. And it just doesn't bother me because God is constantly telling me that he loves me. But if I wasn't in communion with God, it would bother me to have everybody upset and doing the things. If you're bothered by what people have said about you or what they haven't done for you, it's because you've got a deficiency in your relationship with God. Your prayer is more form than it is substance. You may be going through the ritual, but you aren't really connecting with God. You need to minister unto the Lord. I ministered on this, I think it was 30-something years ago when I was on radio. And I was teach I've got a teaching entitled Ministering Unto the Lord. And I was doing this on the radio, and a woman in Huntsville Prison in Texas, she was in for murder, and she was on death row. And, well, you know, I'm a little confused on this. It's been 30-something years ago. But anyway, she was, I think, in solitary confinement, and she was in for murder, and she wasn't going to be eligible for parole until 1999, which at that time was like 25 years in the future. And she had gotten born again, after she got arrested and she was in solitary confinement and she had been spending every day of her life, she was born again and spirit-filled and she was just asking God to kill her because she felt so terrible about what she had done. She had hurt another family, had killed a person. Her family had totally rejected her and they wouldn't have anything to do. So she was just a pain to her family, to the family that she had killed. And now she was in prison, but she was in solitary confinement. She couldn't even witness to a guard. She couldn't do anything to redeem her life and, and compensate for all of the bad that she had done. And so for years, she had been in solitary confinement just asking God to kill her. And she heard me on the radio preaching on that this is what we were made for is to bless God and that God gets blessed when we just say thank you. And this woman wrote me a letter, and I mean, it was a long letter. This is written in pen, and you could see tear stains on it where it had... Uh, made the ink run and this woman was just praising God and she says I've never heard this I never knew that God just loved me and that I could do something I could bless God I could minister unto God and she says now I've got a reason for living she says it's 30 years until I'm eligible for parole but it'll seem like nothing she says I'm no longer in prison I'm no longer got walls around me she says I am in communion with God and she was just praising God and worshiping God. And it was awesome. And I tell you, that woman was freer in solitary confinement than many Christians are who are totally free because they just go through their life worried about this and worried about that. The purpose of your existence 
is to love God and to please Him. He created you for His pleasure. And that's what prayer is all about. It's not just a way to get things. Yes, you can ask and receive, but that is a minute, insignificant part of prayer. If you would start using prayer to just fellowship with Him and thank Him, every day say something about, God, you're a good God. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you that things are as good as they are. They could be worse. You know, you can get to where you're never satisfied. Right now, I've, I've still got things that I haven't obtained. And I've got goals. And I want to reach more people. And I want to do this. And you know what? In a way, you need to keep these things in balance. You don't need to become complacent. Every person needs to have things that you still are believing God for. But I could get so focused on what I don't have that I wouldn't be praising God and rejoicing over what I do have. And that's absolutely wrong. God has been good to me. God has blessed me supernatural. I've got no reason to gripe or complain. I've still got other things I want to see accomplished, but man, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. You start worshiping the Lord and blessing the Lord, and I guarantee you it'll give you a contentment and a joy and a peace. The Bible says that a merry heart does good like a medicine. You would be healthier accidentally than you've ever been on purpose before if you just start fellowshipping with God and using prayer to just thank Him. And I pray that you're getting this. Prayer is just an opportunity to fellowship with God, to love God and to thank Him. Somebody said, well, I don't have anything to thank God for. Man, the spirit of slap comes all over me when somebody <laughs> says stuff like that. If I was God, I'd just drop kick you off into space. <laughs> Hadn't got anything to thank God for. Man. You know, the Bible says in um, Psalms 23, 6, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I was reading that last year, and it said, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. And I said, God, I don't understand this completely, because there's a lot of bad things that happen. There are people that have had tragedy in their life, and there's a lot of bad things following them, and yet this says goodness and mercy will follow them. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, I didn't say only goodness and mercy follow you. There are bad things in every person's life. But that is God promising us that goodness and mercy are with us constantly. And it just, it's your choice whether you're going to focus on the negative things in your life and the things that Satan is trying to do or are you going to focus on goodness and mercy? They're always there. They're always there. There's good in your life. You know, again, there could be a lot of different situations in here. There could be people that are just struggling financially, emotionally, physically. There could be a lot of different problems represented in this room. But you know what? There are a lot of good things. There's a lot of good things in every one of your lives. You live in the freest nation on the face of the earth. And yeah, it's going in the wrong direction and it looks like we're headed for a train wreck. But you know what? Thank God that things are as good as they are. Paul didn't have it near as good as what we've got. And yet he went on and changed the world. We ought to be thanking God that things are as good as they are. We ought to be thanking God that there are people rising up who are trying to do something and change this. We ought to be thanking God. If you are you know, struggling in some area, thank God that at least you've got a Bible college like this. I believe it's an absolute miracle what God has done. I was just talking to Gary Lukey yesterday and thanking him for how good a job he's doing. And I'm saying this Bible college is so far beyond me. I can be gone for three weeks and nobody misses me. They love the other instructors. Man, it's God. It's a God thing. It's not an Andrew thing. It's God has done a miracle here. You're hearing people, some of the best ministers on the face of the earth come through here. You are in a healthy place. And there are people today that are having problems and don't even know about this place, don't know what God's doing. They aren't here. They aren't taking advantage of it. You ought to be praising God that you're here. And if you've got a physical problem or something, what a great place to have a physical problem in. I can guarantee you, man, we have healing school. We have people believing God. This is one of the best places you could be. It doesn't mean that everything is perfect in your life, but you know what? You're better off than if you were out there by yourself. 
having all of the people around you speaking doubt and unbelief and cursing you. Man, praise God that things are as good as they are. If you're struggling financially, you know what? That you're hearing teaching on prosperity. You're seeing it modeled. It's a good place for you to be. It's a healthy place. There's things that are happening here. Paul Milligan's business school is just absolutely awesome. Man, there, you are in such a healthy place. God has done so many awesome things. Got beautiful scenery. Some of you come, yeah, some of you don't like the cold, and I understand, but you know what? There's goodness and mercy here, too. <laughs> you can look through the cold and see the beautiful scenery. And you can, you could focus on that. You could start praising God. And if you were to change your attitude so that you started making prayer about, God, I want to bless you. I want to minister unto you. And if that became the focus of your prayer, that, God, you've got needs. You need someone to just say thank you, to appreciate what you've done. And if you started focusing on God and just loving him and lavishing praise on God and just being thankful for everything, I can guarantee you God would move heaven and earth to meet your needs and to supply these things because God is a giver. And when you start giving to him, he will not let you outgive him. God would bless you. Some of you would have a happiness and a peace and a joy that you've never had before. And yet maybe you've been going through all the religious trappings and you've been binding and loosening and rebuking and doing all of this, but you've never just loved God and used prayer to just be in fellowship with Him. I've heard people call this conversational prayer where you just talk to the Lord like He's a person. I don't know. There's a million different ways to refer to it, but you need to start using prayer for a relationship with God, not a vehicle to go get something. Fill up your pickup and leave and not come back until the next time you're empty. Amen. And you ought to just start fellowshipping with God and using it to worship the Lord and bless Him. It says that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law, 8th chapter of the book of Matthew. For those of you who believe Peter was the first pope, and that he was celibate, that really hinders that doctrine. Because <laughs> if he had a mother-in-law, he probably had a wife. And P Jesus healed his mother-in-law, and she rose and ministered unto them. What do you think that means? She didn't sit him down in a chair and go to preaching to him. I believe she got him something to eat, probably washed his feet, started serving him, blessing him. Just saying, thank you, thank you. You know what? That ministers unto God. It blesses God. Psalms chapter 22, God inhabits the praises of Israel. Man, if you make yourself a praiser, if you're just determined that I'm going to praise God today, I don't care what comes my way, I'm not going to focus on the negative, I'm going to focus on goodness and mercy. I'm going to find the good in whatever's bad. And you start doing that and praising God, I guarantee you God inhabits that. God lives in your praises. There's, there's a scripture, and I believe it's either Habakkuk or um, Zephaniah 3, 17, somewhere around there. But it says that the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will rejoice over thee. He will joy over thee with singing. And if you look those verses up, in the Hebrew, it literally means to dance and to twirl. God literally rejoices over us. Where was that? He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. And that means to dance and to twirl. One time when we were worshiping the Lord, this is back in about 1973, 74, Jamie had an open vision and we were just all worshiping the Lord and she saw angels just dancing and twirling over us and doing these things. That's exactly what that verse is saying. And you know what? If you would start thanking God and using prayer to just bless Him and worship Him and have a relationship with God, it starts supernatural activity in the spiritual realm. It would start releasing your power. Demons flee. They can't stand praise and worship. It's against his nature, and demons flee when you start praising God. Your depression and all kinds of things would leave you if you would just start using prayer to have a relationship with God. Isn't that awesome? 
So I may not have followed all of my outline, but I believe I got across the points that you know what? You need to use prayer and quit making it a religious thing and just really connect with the Lord. If you'll do that, God will bless you. 